Now, in the spirit of um, having um, an emphasis on young people and students tonight, we're going to start with Councillor Anna Baxter. Anna, would you like to tell everybody a tiny bit about yourself and then answer, um, let us know what you think about these questions? Yep, thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'm really pleased that there's lots of you interested in young people and that we're not giving up on democracy. Um, so I'm Anna, I'm a councillor in York. I got elected in May and I'm a second year politics student and I'm the co-chair of the Labour Society there. Um, so couldn't be much more involved if I tried really. Um, um, going back to the questions, I think absolutely, you know, it does need to be reformed, I think. If you look at um, Parliament today, it's not representative of the population and that doesn't encourage people to get involved. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I think that whatever way it is, in one way is representation. Um, there's obviously various other ways with um, the House of Lords, things like that. Um, but I think um, for me as a young person, I wanted to get involved in politics so that other people and young people in politics saw that their voice was heard and that their voice matters. Um, I think the way to do that is by putting pe young people in positions of power, letting their voices be heard, because it's really important that we have our voice because it's the future and young people are the people that um, things like Brexit will affect the most. But obviously, young people under the age of 18 weren't allowed to vote on that. And that will have much um, more of an impact on us than a lot of older people. Um, oh, Um, I think um, um, one of the ways that you can do that is like with um, all women's shortlist, things like that, where you have forums, especially for young people. So they have a designated area and voice um, within um, within um, selection processes. Um, and I know that parties across the spectrum struggle with getting more diverse crowds. in. so I know that, um, you know, the Labour Party isn't alone in that. Um, I think as well, um, one of the things that you can do is votes at 16, you know, it's something that I'd be really keen on. Um, again, it affects us a lot. And we believe that, um, you know, if you can pay tax, if you can join the army, um, if you can start a family, then you definitely do do a lot of the things that um, adults and people over 18 do. But unfortunately, um, they're not allowed to have a voice. So there are a couple of things that I think we could do. I mean, it's 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 a, a long uphill battle, I think, but at least we're starting to have that conversation. Thank you so much for that answer, Anna. There's lots to think about there. And I'd like to encourage anyone here listening to this event tonight, comment in the chat. Let us know if you have any questions for Anna or any of the rest of our panellists. It was also, it was great to hear, like as a young person, uni student myself, from Anna, like I got to say like, I come to this issue from a young person's perspective, but um, also we got a really interesting perspective from Christine, who's here with us tonight. Christine works in Parliament, so I think um, she's going to have a very, I would, <laughs> a very more detailed um, answer for us tonight. So I'd be interested what you think about these two questions, Christine. Hi, um, thank you. So just a, a bit of a background. Um, yes, I work in Parliament, but I'm also the Deputy Chair of Conservative Young Women, which is all women sort of 16 to 35 who want to get involved in politics. Um, in terms of, this, well, in my opinion, two issues, there's getting women into politics and young people into politics, how do you encourage them? But I feel like the book very much focused on democracy in the House, like Parliament's role when it comes to the executive and the governing body um, and various ministers um, since what looks like sort of the Brexit period. What I would say is I think Brexit is actually done quite a good example of showing how parliament can hold the government to account for what's happened. Yes, we had a vote on it. We had a government that tried to push through many bills. Most all of you will remember May. I don't think you can say that Parliament didn't stop the bills when it tried to put them through, and the Lords definitely did. And I think that shows a really strong example of how, no matter what side of the bench you are, you can hold them to account. Like Oliver Letwin took over the order paper. If the government got to run away and sideline Parliament, that would never have happened. The sort of prorogation crisis, the courts stepped in and they stopped that from happening. So I do think our balance of powers do work. And the fact that we have so many 
stories online and we get to hear about ministers like Boris coming to the house being found to lie shows that actually you can't sideline parliament because all of these people have had to hold be held to account and they have paid the consequences at the end of the day and I think that shows that democracy is very strong in the UK for many many reasons whether it's our select committees it's the fact that um we have just thought what consequences Boris is no longer an MP or the Prime Minister I think that's a pretty hefty uh, consequence but we do have select committees we are the number one parliament in Europe that has the most sitting days and the most scrutiny so we as a democracy do hold people to account and the fact that we have free media also helps with that everyone knows what's been happening if you follow politics you know what's been happening it's actually very very hard for the government to get away with anything, it is always brought to the House, whether it's urgent questions, statements, and that just shows that we have a great democracy, in my opinion. Um, not many of the systems, I would say, have changed over time. So I don't know why democracy would be seen broken since Brexit, because these systems have worked through all of our time and they've held every government to account. If you want to talk about Cameron being in the Lords, um, Gordon Brown had two Secretary of State that were in the Lords, for instance, and there are ways in which you can hold them to account. You can make sure those Secretary of State have um, effectively select committees in Westminster Hall. So there are ways around it. We just haven't had to use them or trial them. But I do think that if you are in a position of power, you will have to answer questions. You will have to speak up for what you've done. A lot of the disagreements come from policy change, like agree like areas of focus rather than what they have done in their actions and like i said if you were seen to break the ministerial code you no longer stay a minister or you are put through scrutiny committee or various other institutions that exist in parliament um in terms of getting democracy to thrive it is really important to get young people involved which is all the work we do at conservative young women i'm really proud that pretty much every one of our committee members and really engaged members is either on the candidates list, is a counselor, is running or has given it a try. We pride ourselves on helping young people upskill and learn the ways that they can stand rather than so that we can select them on meritocracy rather than the fact that they are all female or all male. We don't particularly agree with that. We think your talent should show through. So we try and help people show their best selves and make sure they are prepared rather than making sure that they get a step up against their opponents instead. Do you feel like your experiences and views here have changed since you began a career in Parliament or have they always sort of stayed around this um, this way, Christine? Um, I mean, obviously, you get to learn the ins and outs of how this place works, how people how everything from written questions and tabling and urgent questions, like I myself have had to prepare urgent questions, you get about an hour to do it. It's um, (laughs) complete mayhem, but I do think they're incredibly important to have here. I think I'm more knowledgeable now than I was when I was at university studying politics and international relations. But I do also agree that more needs to be done to help people into politics. And I, which is why I spend an awful lot of time doing that. But myself, like I, when I graduated, was lucky enough to pick up a mentor who's a current cabinet minister. Um, and I'm now standing as a GLA candidate in Lambeth and Southwark. So I've had a very good experience and I am trying to pay that back to those who will follow me. And I think that's the best approach. Now I want to actually ask which cabinet minister is your mentor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to say, just before we move on um, to Paul and Nick, um, Anna and Christine, it's really interesting hearing how, you know, the differences between you both, like one of you is working locally, one nationally. And but however, you both have this passion for getting young people, um, especially young women um, in politics. And I was just wondering, I, I felt like I got from Anna this view that that 616 is the way to go, I think you believe there needs to be work done in the party but I heard you like naming a specific policy um I wondered if you guys uh, um whichever of you has a uh feels what wants to can go first but I wondered if you feel like this work needs to be done more in policy and if so what policy or if it's more of a grassroots thing and what sort of actions at the grassroots level do you think it needs um, I can go first, as I said it, <laughs> and I'm sure Chrissy probably disagrees with me on that. 
Um, but I think, um, yeah, local government, also political education in schools. I think, um, you know, there's the option now to do politics A level, which I did, but again, that only covers sort of really base level stuff. And that's if you choose to do it at A level. Um, and again, the numbers on that are increasing, but it's still only those who are probably already interested that um, tend to do it. So I think um, just like in PHSE, you have um, sort of really basic, not brilliant lessons on sort of how to pay taxes and stuff like that. But it's definitely a way that you can make people more aware. And I think naturally through Brexit um, and COVID um, sort of issues like that, it kind of thrust politics into everyone's life. Um, so even, you know, get at school, um, whether you're going in school was sort of, you know, decided by um, the government and things during COVID and the special advisors, because um, obviously that was a really, that was an unprecedented time. So I think that's one way that politics is naturally, um, yeah, sort of come into everyone's life. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't know if you disagree, Chrissy. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I, I think exposure to politics at a young age is important because, I mean, you, you won't know to study something if you don't know it exists. But I don't think we should push everyone to study politics if that's not their interest. Like, there's some people who are very happy to just pay their taxes and don't don't want to scrutinise the government, and that's their choice too. I do think things like social media actually have a massive impact. Like, you have a lot of people who now know about how Parliament works, or like um, MPs will do videos and say, "Oh, this is." talk about the bill or they'll talk about their day in parliament and that has reached a bigger audience than ever before I think if you go back a few hundred years no one ever knew what you did in this place so I do think we're making the right steps and I do think it's important that when someone shows an interest then they are given the support or the information or the knowledge but I think with social media the internet and also any MP would be happy to take you on as a volunteer or to go on a campaigning session so it's also your I mean if it's an interest of yours it's also your responsibility to reach out at no point have I ever had a door closed in my face because I want to do politics I want to stand for election like I've been well supported but I for instance <laughs> I met this minister in a car park at Sainsbury's and offered to deliver leaflets for her that's like how it all started and ever since then I've been taken along the way and my, my party's been very supportive of me I'm sure your party does the same. I mean, you're here, so they must have done a great job. But I do think you can't force everyone to engage in politics, a bit like you can't force everyone to enjoy science if they don't want to. Thank you so much for your answers there. That's been a really little interesting segue. Um, now it'd be great to hear from um, Paul about um, an answer to questions. Does Westminster be need to be reformed? How should it be reformed? I appreciate from Paul, we got slight, we got quite a big answer to that question here. However, it's um, however it'd be great to um, for you to give us um, as much as a streamlined answer uh, to that as possible. Uh, thanks, Maddie. But let me start with what Anna and Christine have been saying about young people, because I think tonight is a very good opportunity to make the point that actually involving 16 and 17 year olds as part of this process is extremely important. I'm prejudiced. I was elected the youngest county councillor a long, long time ago in the country. So I'm already on, on, on with this, but I was persuaded, able to persuade the House of Lords, which is not famous for being particularly young, that they should a vote for 16 and 17 year olds to be allowed to vote in the European referendum in 2016. And the evidence we were able to put before them was that, of course, had been a huge success in extending the vote to 16 and 17 year olds in Scotland. That age group took this more seriously than older people in the 20s and 30s. The men in Scotland didn't register particularly well, voted without thinking so much. And younger people, particularly young women in Scotland, were particularly effective in registering and debating the issues. It was a huge success. And on the back of that, I got the Lords to vote for 16 and 70 year olds to be involved in the referendum in 2016. Sadly, MPs were a bit frightened by that and kicked it out again. So there was a very strong, I think, connection between involving people in voting and then taking an interest what happens to their vote in Parliament. So I'm absolutely with Anna 
and Christine on this, and they are very good example, both of them, of how we've got to persuade all the parties to make this a serious issue in future. But just a bit more widely, let's not ignore the fact that the House of Commons still is not really holding the government to account regularly. I was delighted to hear Christine make a hero of, uh, uh, of Oliver Letwin, who literally took charge of the uh, order paper in 2019 to say, look, come on, the House of Commons has got to have a say about this. At the same time, of course, the House of Commons itself, through the Speaker, objected to being prorogued, told to go home effectively at a time when they ought to have been debating big issues in relation to Brexit. So there are occasions, but they're exceptions to the rule. All too often, the House of Commons just does what the, law, the, the, the executive asks them to do, rather than what their real job is, of course, holding the executive to account. I'm just gonna quote something very quickly, a nice little quote from this week's Economist, which says, the state opening of British Parliament, which took place on November the 7th, is stuffed with pageantry. The most important is a nod to the English Civil War. Black Rod, a stockinged flunky, is dispatched to summon MPs to listen to the King, only for the doors of the Commons to be slammed in her face. The message, His Majesty can wait, parliamentarians run the show. Well, I wish that happened every day of the year, instead of just when the state opening is happening. It isn't happening enough. The House of Commons in particular, and to some extent the House of Lords, should be standing up for us a bit more often and holding the government to account. And that's what our book is all about. Thank you so much, Paul, for that great introdu introduction to your thoughts on this. Um, and it's great to see so many comments. Keep them coming. Keep the questions coming. I'm going to pass over to Nick now to answer answer questions now. Thank you very much. I'm Nick Harvey. I'm Paul's co-author in this endeavour. I'm also the chief executive of the European Movement, campaigning to get Britain back to the heart of Europe. I'm a former Lib Dem MP and was a defence minister during the coalition. Um, I think that Parliament has gone missing in action twice in very dire circumstances in the last few years, and that if we don't learn from that, we're not going to be capable of repairing our democracy. The two things I'm talking about are Brexit and the pandemic both of which I think have had devastating consequences for our economy, our society and our democracy. Uh, I, I listen with interest to Christine's critique that um, because ultimately some of the villains of the piece were thwarted by some means or other, that sort of everything is all right. But I'm afraid I don't really share that cheery view of the whole business. In in the case of Brexit, um, a, a referendum took place that never should have. It was meant to be advisory. It was very close. But Parliament, or to be more precise, um, ministers, went off in a very fundamentalist track, delivering the hardest Brexit they possibly could, despite the narrow vote in what was only an indicative vote in any case. And in the course of all of that, they've done enormous harm. And Parliament should have been able to stop the, the, the worst excesses of all of that. It did have, I mean, Christine does have a point, it, it did have a moment in the sun when um, unexpectedly and by the grace of God, a hung Parliament was returned in 2017, much against Theresa May's calculation and assumption. And because the government did not have a majority in Parliament for those two years, we did get this, this brief little glimpse of daylight of what a properly functioning Parliament could be like, and, and one where a government couldn't just steamroller everything that it wanted through um, tonnage, through holding people to um, uh, the will of the whips. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, the whole saga has been absolutely chaotic and dreadful. We then roll forward to the pandemic. And those of you who f followed the public inquiry taking place at the moment will have seen just how shocking the uh, operation of government was, the 
manner in which decisions were being taken, the disinterest of key people, contracts being placed by wholly irregular means with cronies of various luminaries, uh, and the whole outcome of that, far worse than it need have been, and certainly far worse than it would have been, had we had a properly functioning democracy. The critical thing to remember here is that the public elect a parliament. The public doesn't elect a government. It doesn't get the chance to elect a government. We have a parliamentary democracy. We don't have a presidency or any other system by which a government is directly elected. And the public elect parliament to make law and to hold the government to account. And I just don't believe that parliament in its current culture, its current uh, methodology is capable of doing that. So I totally agree with Anna that we need a much more diverse makeup of the parliament. But as things stand, we're going to struggle to get that. We've got a voting system that corrupts the will of what people want, where typically parties win about 40% of the vote, so there are 60% against them, but they then seize control of all the reins of power, and the powers through weird anachronisms like the royal prerogative are far greater than most other Western democratic governments actually uh, enjoy. Uh, the electoral laws by which the contests take place are all deeply flawed. So it's, uh, there are two pieces of legislation that don't really tie up with each other and monstrous amounts of money can get tilted into key seats, some of which can even come from abroad. There's just an awful lot wrong with uh, democracy, as our book attempts to point out. And there's a radical agenda for any party or any government that would be willing to give things a big shake-up. If, as looks likely, this time next year, um, we get another government elected with a huge majority but on a minority of the votes, they will probably just say, well, you know, the levers of power are now at our disposal. We'll pull them with the same vigour that previous government have. Um, I'd like to think that may not be true. I mean, the best possible outcome would be a hung parliament where parliament could hold government properly to account throughout the five years. But actually, I, I, I've got a lot of time for the current Labour leadership, who I think are, are genuinely um, steeped in democratic in, intent. And I hope very much that they might not simply seize the levers of power but might, over the course of their period in office, actually disperse power, recognise the necessity for plurality, and bring in the sort of diversity that Anna and others um, ha have quite rightly suggested that we need. Thank you so much for your comments there, Nick. Now, I've got so many questions I want to get to in the chat. However, I think Nick and Paul have just covered an awful lot, uh, awful lot here. And I'm I sure i I'm pretty sure I saw Christine writing down some some notes. So I just want to ask um any of our panelists um if they'd like to respond to anything Nick and Paul have said. All right, Christine, kick us off. Sorry, but it, it'd be poor of me to be a conservative and not reply to that. So um in terms of the Brexit vote, I think it's a very dangerous precedent to say that representative democracy should ever overshadow or overrule direct democracy. And OK, whatever you think of the first vote, the second vote, in my opinion, the general election in 2019, our mandate and our campaign logo was to get Brexit done. And we won an 80 seat majority on it. I think it's very difficult to say that the country didn't know what it was voting for when it put us into power. You didn't win, a, you didn't win the vote, though, did you? Sorry, I just ask all panellists to let other panellists finish before they come in, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, in terms of the current investigation, the democracy in Parliament allowed us to remove Boris anyway. So, yes, the inquiry is not going well, but it meant it showed that Parliament has the power to remove the executive should you find that they've gone wrong. And it's exactly what has happened. So, yes, we're going through the investigation now, but we removed him before this investigation even finished. So I think that's quite a strong argument that parliament does work when it needs to and then you refer to the presidential system in which you vote exactly for the president that's fine but 
no time in the US, except for when the debt ceiling is being raised, do you ever have any of the cabinet ministers go and actually answer to the representatives or get scrutinised? And yet our prime minister is scrutinised every single week in the House of Commons. So to me, that sounds like our democracy is stronger because our executive is questioned on a weekly basis. Whereas if you have a presidential election, at no point are they questioned and they can pretty much carry on as they wish. Thank you so much for that response, Christine. I was wondering if Paul or Anna have any comments they'd like to chime in with before Nick can reply to that. Um, I'll, I'll jump in, Paul, if that's all right. I mean, yeah, I agree with Nick on sort of, yeah, voting reform in many sort of forms, including more um, like proportional representation. Um, because every single day on the doorstep, I'm sure Chrissy will agree, you have people saying, well, my vote doesn't count, my vote doesn't matter, so why should I go and vote? And I think one of the ways that you can sort of try and fix that slightly is by having a more proportional um, system. I think a lot of those comments do come from sort of a COVID period. And, you know, for years and years, people have been saying that and it's been increasing more and more that... Um, bad decisions happen at the top of government and people don't feel like um, they're being represented. Thank you so much for that comment, Anna. I've got to note that we've had a few people in the chat mention some similar thoughts to this. Um, someone called Yaromir, um, who says he's a they're a Ukrainian refugee, um, has noted that they can't believe a country with our democratic history has such an outdated system. I was just wondering if any of our panel panelists have a response to this. And also, sorry, if Nick wants to chime in with a response to that, we just completely <laughs> moved on from that. Sorry, Nick, <laughs> as well. Yeah, it is unbelievable that our system is quite so antiquated when you think that in the aftermath of World War II, we helped the Germans rebuild their democracy and their political system. We introduced all manner of things that have improved German democracy enormously, not least was proportional representation, but also serious decentralization in, into the German lender and a, a, a quite different parliamentary system. And they have thrived. They, they, they have done extremely well on that. N nobody in 2023 would seriously export the system as we have it now. I've been a consultant in various democratic countries talking about the strengths and weaknesses of the British system. An ambassador asked me in one country, are you trying to export the Westminster system to us? And I said, good God, no, we can do a lot better for you than that. I'm not surprised that uh, uh, our Ukrainian friends arriving are bewildered by what they see. Um, let me just say in response to Chrissy, I wasn't advocating directly electing a president. I'm simply making the point that we do not elect the government. We elect parliament. And Parliament doesn't even get to decide, other than um, by dint of arithmetic, who the government should be. I mean, most other countries which have a parliamentary system, the formation of a government entails a vote of approval. I mean, we have the King's speech that approves a programme, but if you get changes of prime minister mid-term, which has become an increasingly common phenomenon, no point does Parliament get to uh, approve the changing of the guard. I mean, there's just so much wrong with our system. You don't know quite where to begin. But anyone looking to build a democracy would find precious little in the British system that really commended itself as an exportable commodity. Maybe could I just add one, one you more? Can. <laughs> you can, Paul. Thank you. I mean, I think one of the other features of our system is it is incredibly divisive. Um, uh, you may have, some of you may have had Leila Moran, whose mother is Palestinian, talking on the radio just a few minutes ago, and she was making the point that the House of Commons spends its time dividing. Indeed, that's the phrase they used, the House divided last night. When a great many of the issues that we ought to be addressing require people coming together. I'm actually rather proud of doing things cross-party with the Conservative and Labour people at various stages during my, during my career in both Houses of Parliament, particularly actually in the Lords, but that's another story. And I think that's one of the other things that's wrong about our system. You know, the opposition has to feel that it has to oppose. The people on the government side feel they have to support the government, when actually a lot of the time, quietly, they ought to be seeing if they could find, find ways to agree. 
And that doesn't just apply to the Middle East or to Ukraine, but it ought to apply to things like COVID, because actually that's what our representatives should, I think, be trying to do. And that is something the public is asking for all the time. They're asking for people to work together more effectively. Our parliament doesn't do that. It creates artificial divisions. Anna and Christine, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Paul and Nick, I'm assuming you're on the same team because you've written this book together. So I'm going to pass this one to Anna and Christine. I'm happy to start. Um, firstly, I agree. Like we do work together often. I'm the secretary of an APPG and I love the people I work with. They're so passionate about the subject. And we a lot of that side of things happens outside of the chamber so you will come up with papers and policies and then you will go to ministers and they will be adopted the nature of voting is divisive at the end of the day but one thing that's quite telling is obviously we have fixed terms and i think the fact that a different party can be in government after another if they really hated legislation and policy they could always reverse it and actually that happens quite rarely so is it a complete agreement at that time or is it the fact that a lot of the work has happened behind closed doors and not so necessarily on the chamber floor? Like the reason, the purpose of debate is to scrutinize. So by nature, it is divisive. But also in terms of voting, we did have a referendum on the AV voting system and it failed. So it's not like we haven't tried to change it. It's just we gave the option to the public and they chose not to have it. Anna, I was just wondering what your thoughts on this one are. Yeah, in terms of um, yeah, Parliament and voting being divisive, I think it is quite a big issue. Um, I worked for my MP over summer, Rachel Maskell, um, and a lot of um, my time was spent calling around Tory MPs, asking them to support her bullying at work bill, which, again, no one is going to disagree that we should have better, you know, structures at work so that um, less bullying and uh, whistleblowing um, procedures are in place. Um and they were all lovely and all their staff were lovely. Um, so, you know, I know I know that on on all sides of um, the house and whatever party you're from, there will be some things that you do um, agree on. And I think it is important to recognise and um, use use those agreements to help the country. And I think, again, going back to the doorstep, a lot of people just say, oh, why can't you all get along? And um, all, all you do is bicker with each other and... Um, and I think that would, again, encourage people if they were more, maybe more aware of how much parties already work together um, to see that there is some agreement. And we we do you know, care about voters and, and the public good. Thank you so much for that answer, Anna. Now, I'm just keeping an eye on our time and I'm aware we haven't got too long to address all these great questions we're getting in the chat. But between the questions, I am seeing a divide in this debate and the questions in the chat. There seems to be um, these issues that we think are quite constitutional and are very to do with parliamentary process. And then there seems to be stuff that's affecting voter and, and you know, grasp people working on the ground grassroots directly. And I just want to reference on the latter point, these um, some questions in the chat that I found per, uh, particularly interesting. So Jason McKenna, McKenna, who's currently doing a PhD on how abuse is, put, is putting people, but especially women off standing for election, is, that, is, um, is asking just to, um, if you have any comments on that, I'd be particularly interested from hearing um, from Christine and Anna, if that's cool. Uh, I don't mind starting unless you want to, Anna. Um, yeah, no, that comes up quite a lot for obviously conservative young women. And actually it's what stopped me doing my PAB for two years because I was like, actually, is this the life I want? I mean, I'm an aide anyway to a member of parliament and I already get death threats. So can you imagine when you're in the limelight what happens? But I think this is the problem we have where social media does actually impact democracy and it does impact representation. I think there was a um, poly monitor did research in our last election about who got the most abuse most regularly and women topped the top 10, like without fail, it didn't matter. Like we obviously had Boris Johnson and yet women were getting more abuse every, I think someone got it every 15 seconds, they got tweeted a bit of abuse. And obviously that's going to impact a lot of people and you have to kind of decide in yourself are you going to let these people, these keyboard warriors, stop you? Like, in my opinion, I'd rather be the person that woke up every day, fought for what I wanted, 
and tried hard for what I believed. But I really understand why a lot of people wouldn't do that. Um, because why why would you put your family, your life, it's hard when you have kids on the line. Like there was an MP where these people actually videoed a fake video of them kidnapping their child and sent it to the MP. The, the child was at school, it was absolutely fine. But imagine being at school in the chamber, getting this video and you think your child's been kidnapped. Like the fact that anyone thinks it's okay to treat representatives and politicians that way, regardless of what side of the house you're on, it's just not acceptable. And unless we get social media companies to do more, or we find a way to protect ourselves, then it will continually stop people entering politics and probably the right type of people, sadly. Mm. Thank you so much for that answer, Christine. Anna, I just wondered if you wanted to share any thoughts on this. Yeah, this is, again, something that I feel really incredibly passionate about. Um, so as I say, I worked for my MP, Rachel Maskell, over summer, and she has to have reinforced glass on her office because of the death threats and because the police have advised her um, to do that. And on the doorstep, I've people have, you know, put death threats um, to her name. But I've also experienced this quite a lot on the doorstep um, with a lot of, I'm afraid, older men saying horrible things to me and my colleague, who is also a younger woman. Um, and I was lucky enough to be shortlisted for a parliamentary seat over summer. Um, and I got really excited. You thought I thought, oh, this is brilliant. And then received a barrage of tweets online um, because an account called Tomorrow's MPs run by Michael Craig tweeted about me. And I literally received hundreds of messages on my Twitter um, saying the most horrible things about me. Just nothing that was true. And it really sort of put me off. And, I, you know, as much as I was proud of my achievement to have got that far, um, it really discouraged me from sort of putting my name out again when I'd experienced it um, when I was running for council and then when I was trying to sort of run for parliament it really um, knocked me back and I'm sure he was probably aware of what he was doing in the comments that I would receive because of that but you know that that wasn't deemed that important by him which I think is really disappointing that journalists are putting stuff out like uh, out like that that encourages um, sexism and ageism and all kinds of abuse like that. Thank you so much for that answer, Holly, and for yours, Christine. It's great to hear personal experiences um, of like the abuse women face in politics. I mean, it's not nice to hear, but it's it's good that you're telling making these horrible stories hit, and hopefully we'll hear less and less of this um, in the future. Um, I was just um, on the constitutional notes, so we've been doing we've been focusing on grassroots. It's time to talk a bit more about the parliamentary process, um, which is what all of you are here for, I'm sure. Um, so we had some great questions from um, more from Jason McKenna, but also Stephen Gosling, who's I think is on the board of Unlock Democracy. We've had a great question from them. Specifically, Stephen Gosling asked whether it's too easy for MPs and the cabinet to sidestep questions. Wondered if any of you have thoughts on that in particular. Could I say something about that? Uh, I think Christine said earlier that uh, private members' questions actually puts the prime minister on the spot. Frankly, I think Nick would agree with me, no way. There's a football crowd behind whoever's prime minister cheering them on. The really effective questioning takes place at the liaison committee. And that is interesting in two ways. Firstly, it was set up by Robin Cook when he was a leader of the House and the Labour government, rather against the better judgment of Tony Blair. And he did it by agreement. I and the Conservative shadow leader of the House, we agreed together it would be much more effective if the Prime Minister came before a smaller group of MPs, the chairs of all the select committees, and that then he would be questioned without all the civil servants sitting around him, let alone a lot of ministers, and without a baying crowd of supporters behind him. And actually, Tony Blair was rather good at it. And then, of course, enjoyed doing it. So have several of his successors been rather good at it. But much more important, from the point of view of the public, there is actually an exchange of information. The prime minister is put on the spot. It's no slick answers. When the prime minister appears at prime minister's question each Wednesday, he's got a great book in front of him. And he knows who's going to ask the questions. He knows probably what sort of questions are going to be asked. And he's got a little slick answer for them all. And it's very difficult, actually, to get underneath that and get a real genuine exchange of information. The liaison committee is quite different. So on two uh, grounds, I would say that's the example to take. If you have a proper grown up discussion, question and answer, real information, good. But also it's good that that was agreed across party. 
rather than it was simply imposed upon Parliament by the government of the day. Thank you so much, Paul. I just wondered if anybody else has any thoughts on this question. Um, if I may, I mean, one of the problems with parliamentary questions is it's all incredibly arbitrary. Uh, you, you put your name in a hat, it may or may not get pulled out of the hat, so you may or may not get the opportunity to ask the question. And if you do, you only get the one go at it. So our questioner's thesis that it's too easy for ministers to sidestep the question, I'm afraid, is basically right because if they give an evasive answer the questioner doesn't get another go i think the point that christine was actually making is that the the effectiveness of urgent notice questions is um something to be lauded and actually i agree with her i i think those um urgent questions are probably one of the few really effective means of trying to hold government to account. Speaker Burke, whatever his other shortcomings, was very prone to granting urgent questions on the topic of the day. And I think these often put government ministers in a very uncomfortable position, not least if they hadn't really intended to be in Parliament that day, they could suddenly find themselves at the dispatch box. But also, if it was a topical issue and lots of MPs had turned up to ask questions about it, even if the minister sidestepped the first one, there were plenty of reinforcements there, other MPs prepared to follow through on it. it, it it's one of the few bits of the questioning, and I agree with Paul that the um, the, the select committee chairs getting a couple of hours with the prime minister works rather well also but i mean I, i've been on that side of the dispatch box as a minister and if you get an awkward question there's a whole variety of answers that you can use to bat it away and um that's the end of that kind of thing really <laughs> thank you very much nick christine's got her hand up so i'll pass over to her so i, I also just to add, i also think the televisation of sort of things like liaison committee is really important because it's not just the people who are questioning ministers prime ministers the whole nation has the ability to watch and you for yourself can judge whether they do like dodge the question or not which is also a good thing for democracy in my opinion because people feel more involved because they can just turn on their laptop and watch on any subject they wish christine just made a point that's very similar to a question I was just going to ask. The experiences you guys are feeding back to me seem to very much stem and be influenced by your time in Parliament, but of course not very, a very large amount of the conversation will never set foot inside a Parliament, let alone um, be privy to select committees and and questions. What do you think, how do we bridge this gap between, um, to increase this political engagement when people are so, are, detached from political happenings what do you does anyone have any thoughts on this especially for young people I'd love that if we could bear that in mind as well in the answer Christine oh, I don't mean to answer every question here oh, we uh, love it. <laughs> multiple ways so every every school every person has an MP often MPs will go into those schools if invited and talk to students about democracy we also have Parliament Week, which is something the speaker runs, which is the whole point is to engage young people in democracy in Parliament. You also, if you are a constituent, you can ask your MP for a tour of Parliament, but you can also ask for tickets to PMQs and to the Chamber. We also have a complete open Parliament in the sense that, okay, you go through parliamentary security, but you can just turn up and say, I want to go to the Chamber and watch these questions, and they will let you through. You can go into Central Lobby and they'll put you up um in the gallery to watch so yes okay it's in london so it's not ideal a lot of people can't travel which is why we have tv we have email you can phone your mp you can go to surgery appointments there's lots of different ways of accessing representatives democracy parliament um whether there's one place where all of these examples are maybe that's something to work on or just ask someone if you know anyone in politics most people are really happy to have a coffee and just say yeah We'll meet, we'll talk, tell me what, what it is in politics you want to do, and I'll tell you ways of getting into it. That's a great response to hear. Thank you, Christine. I work for the Politics Project and we do democratic education in schools. And it's really inspiring seeing so many young people um, getting involved in politics 
through you know seeing seeing politicians come to them where they are in school and I think what the stuff you mentioned about how technology can be used to facilitate democracy I think that's in that very similar ethos of like people coming to where young people are and and meeting them where they're at. Anna, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on like ha- on youth outreach of politics. Like I'm sure both of us have friends um in their early 20s like us who are non-political. Um how do you think they what do you think could do and imp- could be improved to get them more involved in politics? Yeah, um I think Chrissy touched on a lot of them parliament week. You know, I went and speak to my local sixth form um year 12s about um sort of local government and um national government. And I think it does it does also massively depend on your actual MP themselves. Um obviously a lot of MPs are more active than others. We're really, really lucky in York Central that we have Rachel Maskell, but unfortunately in York Outer, our MP just isn't too active. And um, you know, I've been involved in sort of the sphere of York politics for quite a while now. Um, and he doesn't tend to sort of attend community events, things like that. Um, whereas Rachel Maskell is at every single thing that you can possibly imagine. And I think the visibility of your MP is really, really important. Um, because if you don't see your representative, then you you don't, you know, you don't know what they believe in, you don't know how they vote if you're not in that sort of regular dialogue in the um in the sort of community. And I think social media again really good way that you can involve young people um with um I know Dr Luke Evans MP has got a TikTok that I really enjoy despite him being a conservative um because it's really insightful um that he just sort of posts little videos and you can see what he's up to um in the House of Commons which ministers he's meeting and I think um yeah on Twitter you can sort of get regular updates so I think social media is a good um sphere that young people are pretty engaged in already um to see what they're up to. I am Luke Evans' MP's biggest fan. And that is me being nonpartisan because the way he uses TikTok to educate young people on politics is fantastic. And I wrote a 2,000 word essay on him the other week for class. (laughs) Just to put my point out there further. Now, I'm just just noticing we're short on time. So I'm going to give you all two minutes to answer this question. And it is from, let me get the name. It's from Michael Holland as our big final question of the night. So congrats, Michael Holland. Um, And it is, can each member of the panel tell us one way in which they would change things to enable parliament to better hold the government to account? Shall we start with Nick? Um, Honestly, the best way would be to change the electoral system so that the government had to win a majority. And if it was not able to do that, it would have to build a majority every night on every measure that it wanted to get through. If we can't deliver that um, immediately, then my, my next single biggest measure would at least be to ensure that any government seeking to be formed has to have a vote of confirmation in the House of Commons first, um, which may sound blindingly obvious, but it, this could be, it, it, we could learn from the Americans and have confirmatory hearings for each minister in the government by the relevant select committee and so on. Um, other countries do this as a matter of course. We just think it's somehow natural that the king sends for someone he thinks might be able to command a majority and invites him to form a government. It's really weird. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, can we just ask that everybody a- answers this question with a different answer? That way we get four whole ways to improve. Um, so not just two different ways. Okay, shall I pass over to Anna? And if you're okay to keep your answer short because we have very short time. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, I think, um, while I do agree with Nick, I'll give a different answer. Um, I think one way is having stricter rules on sort of... Um, members of parliament so them having to turn up certain meetings as a councillor you're held to account and um uh, you'll basically be kicked off the council if you don't attend meetings for six months so i think it's really important that you know we've had examples of mps for um yeah i won't mention names but um not turning up to surgeries not not actually having them in the first place and not being seen in the constituency 
again with the rule of not you don't actually have to live in your constituency as well I think that's really important that um, you're in the community you use the services that your constituents do so you understand the struggles that they face um, so I think stricter rules on MPs um, would be a fairly sort of obvious way to hold them more to account and then they'll take that into parliament with them as well. Thank you so much Anna. Christine can I pass over to you please? I'm going to go with the Lord's reform, um, just because we haven't mentioned it yet. <laughs> um, but for me, I would make sure that the Lord's is slightly more representative. So, for instance, we have 26 bishops. I would introduce um, sort of authority figures like the chief rabbi. So it's more representative of our country. And, and secondly, I would stop prime ministers being able to appoint um, when they resign people to the Lord so that it goes back to being a expert scrutiny house rather than people's friends. Thank you so much, Christine. And Paul, last answer of the night, what would you change? Well, first of all, of course, I'd agree with everybody else, particularly Christine. What I would appeal to everybody on this call is uh, if they don't want to buy our book, make sure your college library or your other library has already bought it for you because there's a lot there. And we really want to have feedback from people on a call like this what they think is important. But just if I may pull one extra out from the book, there's far too much use of big money in our politics, and it's going the way of the Americans if we're not careful. There's a whole lot of examples in the book of where money and going for money, of trying to get money, trying to get millionaires rather than more millions of votes has become the way in which British political parties want to apparently operate. I think that's a step in the wrong direction I think we should be encouraging people of all ages and all backgrounds to make their contributions by having the same sort of system as with charities. If you pay any money for a charity, you get tax relief. Not everybody is paying taxes yet, but they will be at some point. And if you could have tax relief for modest support to a political party, that's much more healthy than having to rely on foreign millionaires or billionaires or even the Russians to pay for our politics. Thank you so much for your answer, Paul. And I've got to say thank you so much for a great and healthy debate, not just um, here from our panellists, but from everyone in the chat. It was, I think we could have gone on talking about this for hours, but, you know, we've all got to have lives outside of this. Um, and also, um, I think that some of the stuff we touched on, we could also break these down into other whole other panels by itself. But just thank you for everyone for your fantastic remarks. And thank you for such interesting questions. There's so much to think about. And if we want to read more about it we know where to go okay um can i pass i'm just gonna pass back over uh to radix to, to sophie to close the event thank you so much everyone hi thank you maddie and thank you to our wonderful panelists love listening to the debate tonight and thank you to our great audience for being involved in the discussion as everyone's just said you can check out or ask your library to obtain can parliament take back control by nick and paul and now finally i'll hand over to ben rich uh Radic it's Big Tent's chief executive to say a final few words. Thank you. And I'm just going to say um, a very quick thank you because um, my wife has been cooking dinner downstairs and not only does it smell great, but every time she turns the microwave on, you all vanish. So <laughs> I had, uh, moments of missing the call. But I did just want to say a big thank you to all of our speakers. Um, this is a subject to which we would like to return. And if others on this call... Uh, wish to raise particular issues, please do contact us. This is Radit Rex's main mission is to be a platform for those outside the Westminster bubble to have that opportunity to help shape our debate. So thank you again, particularly Maddie for chairing us brilliantly and steering tonight's discussion, but to all of our panel. And good night. Join us again. <laughs>